Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome to Bending B Hats Benefits. My name is Steve Persh. I'm an agency and community engineer at Pantheon. We're a sponsor here at DrupalCon. You can see us down on the main convention floor. Uh, again, I'm an agency and community engineer. That means I spend a lot of my time working with agencies and web development teams, adopting Pantheon, working on Drupal best practices. A lot of what I've done lately is related to our continuous integration tooling. Often when working with continuous integration, you may want to use an automated testing tool like BHAT, and that's what we'll be talking about today. You can find me online as Steve Vector on GitHub, Drupal.org, WordPress.org, uh, Twitter, I'll be tweeting out a, a link to these slides after the presentation, and, and you can, of course, email me. So uh, today what we're talking about BHAT, we'll be talking about the what, the why, the who, the where, the when, and the how of BHAT, those wonderful five W's and, of course, a how. Uh, we're starting with what. What is BHAT? Uh, I'm curious, in the audience here today, who here has used BHAT? Uh, oh, wow, more, more people than I was expecting. Not, not everyone in the room, but uh, for the recording we had, I, I think a little over half the audience raised their hands. For those of you who haven't used BHAT, that's fine. We'll, we'll go over some introductory things. I'm curious, for the people in the room who have used BHAT, how many of you have used it as a, a client communication tool. How many of you who, have, who are using BHAT have clients who are actually looking at, <laughs> at your BHAT test and it's far fewer people in the audience? I think I saw two hands there. Two people have clients who are, are looking at their, their BHAT tests. Uh, okay, good to know. So using BHAT and Drupal together, again, we're talking about just what is BHAT. Uh, BHAT is a PHP command line tool that you can use for behavior-driven testing. When you're using BHAT, there are three main elements that I want you to be aware of. We have BHAT, the PHP command line tool that we'll take a look at in just a second. We have an actual Drupal site somewhere. I'm about to do a live demo where I have a site running locally. You might have a site running up on the internet, maybe on a Calibox locally. You may have a site somewhere. And then you have documented what you expect the behavior of that site to be. These expectations are written in plain English. They're written in dot feature files. These are simply plain text files that document what you expect the behavior of your Drupal site to be. So uh, BHAT looks at those expectations, look at, looks at the actual Drupal site, and compares the two. So it reads the dot feature files, and it interacts with the Drupal site. Now, often when I, I heard BHAT described to me when I was first getting familiar with it about two years ago, I just had a very hard time wrapping my mind around, wait, what are we actually talking about? What does this actually look like to use BHAT? So it's, it's a little risky to start a presentation with a live demo. I feel like I'm living on the edge here, living dangerously, but that is what I'm going to do. I am going to start this presentation with a live demo. Jumping over to my command line here, I have BHAT, the command line utility. I happen to be inside of a, a Drupal 8 site right now. I'm going to jump over to PHP Storm where we can see here is all of my Drupal 8 code. I've got my vendor directory where dependencies like bhat live, and I have a bhat-local.yaml file. Uh, .local is compared to Pantheon. If I wanted to run these uh, bhat tests against Pantheon, I could, but I don't want to be uh, extra risky in my live demo here. I'll run this against a local site. So we can see here uh, the, the main bit of configuration I want you to see here is that I am pointing at a base URL that is uh, local here. Again, jumping back to the command line. So I've, I've told B, uh, BHAT on the command line. Haven't yet run this command yet, but I'm about to. I've told it that the configuration is here. BHAT local.yaml is the configuration, the config that it's about to take. And the, uh, the dot feature file that I want BHAT to process, the set of expectations that I want BHAT to process uh, is a, a file named who's new dot feature, and that lives in the features directory. Jumping back over to PHP Storm, just to briefly look at, at this, we'll, we'll look at it in greater detail as the presentation goes on, but I do just want you to see that this is a plain text file. I've got two BHAT scenarios that I'm about to run here. All right, so now uh, I, I hadn't showed this part to you yet. I do have the actual Drupal site. It's a totally vanilla Drupal core site. Not much to it. The part that we're, we're testing with these um, BHAT scenarios is the who's new block. All that does is just list the recently created site, uh, recently created accounts on this site. It's just a normal part of Drupal core. I've got a very simple BHAT feature file that's going to uh, test my expectations for the who's new block. All right, live demo time. Going to, oh no, oh no, what did I do as I was, 
Oh wow, that I I uh, I added a comma as I was interacting with uh, with PHP Storm. All right, so I, I feel like that that was probably my lesson for attempting a live demo. I hope it, it goes smoothly from here on out. I've added breakpoints here. A nice feature in in uh, the Drupal extension for for Behat, which I'll talk about later, is this ability to add breakpoints. So I'm just going to be hitting the Enter key as I go along here to let me pause and, and talk about these things. So uh, Behat is processing my my dot feature file up at the top here. It's it's telling me the feature that's being being tested, it's the, the who's new block, and here we get really to the meat of things. Uh, Behat is logging in as an administrator. It has used Drush to create a brand new administrative account. And with that administrative account, it's now going to visit the, uh, the URL admin slash people slash create. Looking at that in, in my real browser, this is just the normal Drupal core form for adding a, a new user account. And now Behat uh, is going to, to fill out all of these form elements. So it's adding the, the email address, adding the name, adding the password, on and on, uh, hitting the, the create new account button, and then going back to the home page. And hooray, we have two new accounts, the, the one uh, that was just created so that we could log in as a throwaway administrative account, and then that test account that was actually added to be uh, detected by this BHAT scenario. And we can see here that the way it's checking for uh, this test account is by just checking for the, the string test account one in the uh, CSS ID block views block who's new block one. So this is, this is a test that I think developers can understand. We can understand what Behat is doing. It's just simulating some browser interaction. And this gets the job done for automation. This isn't a great tool for communicating with your clients. I wouldn't want to show someone unfamiliar with the implementation details of HTML. Uh, this as, as a way of understanding the who's new block. There's a whole lot of implementation details here around the creating account form. So the second scenario is going to test basically the same thing and I think a way that is more understandable by uh, perhaps your client. It will again sign in first as an administrator and then using custom written BHAT steps, it's going to do basically the same thing. It's going to make a new account but rather than making that new account by uh, by manually visiting the create account form. I've just written a custom step that, that does that same thing, creates a new user account, and then goes to the home page, specifying it as when I go to the home page rather than the, the more developer oriented when I visit just slash, and then it, it checks for basically the same thing. Then I should see the new username for that new account in the who's new block. I think this is a more readable way of, of doing it than referencing the exact CSS ID in your, your feature file. So uh, for those of you new to Behat, they may, that may have been a whole lot of information all at once, but I did want to just give you a sense of what does it look like to run uh, a Behat test. There we go, we have two scenarios that passed. We could plug this into a, a continuous integration environment and automatically execute our, our tests. So, and, and we saw two, two types of tests. Now, now, why would you actually do this? Jumping back uh, to, the, to the slides here, why would you use Behat? Why would you use any automated testing tool? Well, uh, continuous integration is a really popular topic these days. If you go down to the, the Pantheon booth, you'll see a demonstration of a, of a relatively complex continuous integration process. One of the great parts about continuous integration is that if you have automated tests, you can be much more confident that the changes you're making, that the, the new feature you're adding, if you're adding the who's new block to your site, none of your other features have broken. That's a, a great part of testing, just the ability to automatically run those tests over and over again in perpetuity, verifying that you haven't broken anything. But there are other reasons to test, quoting my colleague Michelle Krejci here. There are other reasons to test, among them defining done with a client and translating the definition of done into code so that we can know when a feature is complete. This adds focus, it adds documentation, and yes, it adds regression testing. And this, this really is where BHAT shines, the ability to have a better conversation with your client about what do they actually expect from that who's new block. Uh, this allows us to, to get both of these benefits. So the primary benefits of BHAT that I'll be talking about today, automation, this is a benefit that you get really from any automated testing tool. You get this benefit if you're using Selenium directly. You get this benefit if you're using PHP unit. 
Behat shines with the, the benefit of clarity. If you're using Behat well, this should give you a clearer picture as a whole team, the developers, the project managers, your client stakeholders, it should give everyone on the, on the project a clear understanding of what the definition of done is. Quality is a benefit we often expect to get from testing tools. Uh, I don't think this is a, a benefit you get directly from, from BHAT, and I'll uh, explain why. So uh, a simplified view of the different types of testing. This comes uh, from a, a blog post on the econo economy of, of testing, uh, a blog post from the author of, of BHAT it, itself. He simplifies types of testing into unit testing, integration testing, and system testing. When we're talking about unit testing, we're talking about the smallest units that we have as developers, testing individual functions, testing individual classes, testing individual methods. Uh, we know we're doing unit testing when we can reason about our tests in isolation, when we can look at a test and see that the only thing that this test touches is a method, and it's a method that someone on the team wrote. It's a method that we have totally under our control. So this is a great way of answering the question, is our code any good? If you're doing test-driven development and writing these very granular unit tests, these unit tests will guide you towards writing good code, code that is uh, decoupled, code that is clean, code that's, that's readable. Integration tests are, are meant to give you a slightly different benefit. Integration tests, uh, well, they, they do what it sounds like. They, they test the integration of different units. Sometimes those may be units totally under our control. Sometimes that may be units that uh, interact with uh, a third-party API that's, that's outside of our control. I think we're less likely to see integration testing in the Drupal community because often we're dealing with the smallest units or we're dealing with the complete picture. So integration tests are, are meant to answer this question of do our pieces fit together, but often when we're working with Drupal, it's hard to subdivide our, our pieces and say, I'm only testing the back end and not testing the theme layer. Drupal is, is still relatively monolithic. Often when we're working with Drupal, we're doing system testing. And this is really what BHAT is designed for, system testing, testing a complete website very often. BHAT can be used for test, testing things other than websites, but mainly what we're talking about today is testing a complete website running in a production like environment uh, or, or just running on, on my local machine here. This is verifying the system as a whole, answering the question, do all of our pieces fit together? Uh, you can think of these different types of testing as, as answering, again, different questions. Did we build the thing right? This is a question unit testing can help you address versus did we build the right thing? Did we build what our, our client actually expected? You could have a uh, the old users block and, and have really clean code that gives you the old users block, but that's not what your client asked for. Building the right thing is, is what BHAT is designed for. So who is going to use BHAT? Well, who cares about our website at all? Often when we're making websites, we have at least two groups of people. We have often the, the people building the website. Uh, often these are people working at an agency, working with a client, your developers, your designers, project managers, uh, everyone working at the agency. And that they can be somewhat separated from the people using the, the website. Often you have a, a main point of contact, a, a main point of contact with your client. You have uh, stakeholders who are, are working at, at the same company as, as your client, and they have their own end customers. And one way to, to conceptualize how, how all of these different people work together is by separating each group from one another. You have the, the stakeholders and the end customers, and they have expectations for what the website is supposed to do, and they may communicate that to the, the one person at your client who really owns the, the website as a whole. You, you can call that person a, a product owner. The product owner at, at uh, your client company describes what they expect from the website, maybe to a, a tech lead or a business analyst uh, at the agency or, or within the web development team. They then write down detailed requirements, often just in, in bullet list form of, of what are the requirements for this site. Those can then be formed into to tickets that get handed off to a, a project manager. The project manager then hands off those tickets to a developer. The developer then may take the tickets, look at the bulleted list, write uh, tests that are really only readable by developers, do the work, maybe hand it off to a QA person, and then the QA person may uh, send it along to the, the final approval and, and deployment process. And each step is, is separated out from, from the next. The developer maybe is never talking to the product owner, maybe never talking to an actual person who really relies 
on this website. So if this is the way you're conceptualizing uh, of a development process, then BHAT is going to be a, a difficult tool to use because BHAT encourages everyone in the process to at least at one point in time have a conversation about what does everyone actually expect from, uh, from the website. At least one conversation that is going to set expectations for what we're doing here. Uh, a leader in the behavior-driven development community says this is really the, the point of, of writing our, our expectations in these plain English dot feature files. They allow more people to get involved. Uh, if, you're, if you're not writing down your expectations in plain English, then you're going to have uh, clients who think, well, I don't really know how the site really works. That's for the developers to know. Only the developers can read the tests. I'm further removed from that. By writing out your expectations in plain English, it's a chance for everyone in the process to get involved and, uh, and have a common understanding of what we're doing here. So these dot feature files should really be a representation of a conversation that was had at some point in time by everyone involved in the process. This, this should really be uh, the anatomy of a conversation. So what are we talking about at all? That's that first line in the dot feature file. What, what are we even talking about? We're talking about the who's new block. That should be easy to scan right there at the top of the file. That is the feature that we're talking about. And, and who even needs that and, and why do they need that? These, these top lines are not the computer processable lines. As we get lower, we'll, we'll get to the machine executable steps. These are really just for people to read and, and get some understanding of what are we even talking about? What feature are we building? If, if your uh, expectations are just written out in bulleted lists, it can, be a, it can be difficult to know what are we even talking about, who needs this feature, why do they need it. Getting into these scenarios, each scenario is uh, a description of what can this feature even do. Well, in this case, this feature can display new users in a list. You might have a, a negative scenario saying old users don't appear in the list. In this case, we've just got one saying new users appear in the list. Here's where we get into the, the really machine executable parts, the, the strict given, when, then syntax. The expectations here are that the given portion, this is where you're starting from. Before we even talk about the, the who's new block specifically, where are we even starting from? Well, we're starting from the point of being logged in as an administrator. And we're assuming that recently, at some point in time, a new user account has been created. The, uh, the when portion, this is our, our logged in user actually doing something. Each of these dot feature files, each of these sh scenarios should be describing a person doing something, a person actually interacting with your website. And that's what the when clause is for, that person actually taking an action. In this case, it's a pretty small action. All they're doing is going to the home page, but they may be taking a more complex action. The then portion is the observable result. And observable is really the key word here. Uh, an actual administrator for this site should be able to read this scenario and understand what's happening. They should be able to say, oh yeah, I, I really can see new user accounts in that block. You could write these then clauses against like reading database tables directly. You could uh, write this scenario to say, uh, okay, then I print out uh, all of the rows in the user table and I see that there's a new user there. Well, that's not really observable to the end users of, of your website. The then clause should really be about observable things. And it's important to remember that these dot feature files alone are not our tests. This is a, a bit of a, a pedantic point, uh, again, from Constantine, the author of, of BHAT. These are really just our expectations. The feature files alone are not the tests. The feature files are the expectations. In order to, to have tests, in order to be doing testing, we need a couple other pieces. We need something like BHAT that can actually evaluate those expectations and compare them to an actual thing. So if we're, if we're using BHAT with Drupal, then uh, the dot feature files, again, are our expectations. The Drupal site is the actual thing, and the uh, BHAT command line program is the means of comparison. If you're doing PHP unit uh, testing directly, then you'll probably see those, those functions that, that have uh, an expected, an actual, and an assertion. In between, you need those three elements, an expected, an actual, and an assertion of comparison. So where, where are we actually running BHAT? Where do these pieces actually go? So Pantheon uses BHAT with all of our WordPress plugins. We use uh, BHAT in a bunch of different ways. So with our WordPress plugins, we use BHAT to answer the question, does this work on Pantheon at all? We're looking here at a, just a screenshot of an internal dashboard we have. We have a CircleCI 
badges and, and Travis badges lined up with a couple of our WordPress plugins. So we're, we're answering two different questions here. Does this plugin work at all? And does it work on Pantheon? Before I started at Pantheon, we were already answering the question, does this plugin work at all? We, to answer that question, we have a WordPress site. It installs the given plugin, WP Redis, native session handling. We've, we've got a, a bunch of different plugins. So we have WordPress running just in a Ubuntu container. Uh, again, all we're trying to answer is, does this plugin work at all? PHP unit is, is the normal way the WordPress community does automated tests, so we use that. That's uh, the test that we've had written for years with these plugins, and these happen to be running inside of uh, Travis CI. So this is how we answer abstractly, does WP Redis work at all? Does uh, WP Native Sessions work at all? That's separate from the question, does this work on Pantheon? So when I started at, at Pantheon a year and a half ago, I didn't have a ton of familiarity with WordPress, but I was still occasionally reviewing some pull requests here, and I wanted some level of confidence. Not only does this pull request allow the plugin to continue working, but I really want to make sure that it's not going to break anything Pantheon specific. That's kind of a, a different question to answer. So to answer that question, we again have a WordPress site. It's running on Pantheon. All these plugins have uh, WordPress sites running on, on Pantheon. Every single time we get a, a pull request, Behat runs a, a set of tests against that WordPress site running on Pantheon, and Circle CI happens to be the tool we're using to execute those tests. Uh, I want to look more closely at the, those um, YAML configuration files. We, we saw that in the live demo, a YAML configuration file that really sets up how, how Behat executes. The main thing I want to point out here is that in your behat.yaml file, you're going to specify the path of the dot feature files. Uh, where are these expectations actually living? With all of these WordPress plugins, we have two sets of expectations. The expectations specific to the plugin, we want to be able to install the Redis plugin, go to the administrative page, verify that it's actually connected to Redis, and I also want to make sure that I'm not breaking anything in WordPress core itself. So we have a separate suite of tests that we add in with Composer. So those are living in a different path. Those are living in the vendor directory. These are expectations just general to WordPress core. The fact that we can add posts, we can add users, we can add taxonomy terms, make comments. And anytime we add one of our plugins, Redis, native session handling, we shouldn't break any of those. So we should be able to execute all of those same tests, those same tests that just verify WordPress core behavior, we should be able to execute those tests with any of our plugins installed. So uh, th there are a few terms that you'll hear often in, in BHAT. And even for the first year or two that I was working with BHAT, I didn't have these terms fully differentiated. So I just want to talk about three terms you'll hear a lot with, with BHAT. Contexts, drivers, and extensions. First, let's take contexts. So contexts are how BHAT understands these dot feature files. These dot feature files, again, have the given, when, then syntax. How do we actually map between the, the phrases in those dot feature files and actual PHP execution? So we do that with context files. They're just PHP classes, and they use uh, annotations here to line up between these plain text phrases like uh, given I am on the home page, there's some regular expressions here so that, that you can vary them slightly, but basically given I am the home page maps really to a, a one line function here. Only one line of PHP is executing here, visit path. That's all that happens when you, you use the, the phrase given I'm on the home page. Uh, the when clause, a lot of the examples in in minkcontext.php are, are from the world of Batman, so when I select bats, from user fears, then this relatively simple PHP uh, method executes. It's, it's really just these three lines. Uh, moving on to the then clause, then I should see who is the Batman. All we're doing here is checking for text uh, in our, our HTML page. Again, it's just a one line function. These contexts don't have to be all that complicated. Now, you may be thinking, Steve, there's no way it's really that simple. Uh, there's no way we're really just visiting the home page with a single line of PHP. So uh, contexts are one level of abstraction. They abstract between those plain text feature files and the world of PHP. Drivers are a, la a layer deeper of abstraction. So two places you'll hear about drivers a lot are, are Mink and Drupal drivers. First, taking uh, the, the concept of Mink drivers. 
the mink is a, a way to actually do browser execution. And this is an abstraction layer that allows you to use a, a common interface, a common set of phrases like give it on, on the home page, and then execute those with different uh, browser simulation tools. So if you want to actually execute JavaScript, you're going to need something like Selenium. It, it can do more things, uh, but it runs a little bit slower. Uh, Goot and, and BrowserKit run much faster, but they don't process uh, JavaScript. So you can switch between these without rewriting everything. Drivers are an abstraction layer. As long as you're implementing a, a PHP interface, uh, the, the driver is going to work. Drupal drivers, another thing you'll hear about a lot when using Behat with uh, Drupal. These uh, are an abstraction layer that determine how Behat actually interacts with your, your Drupal site. So if you're using the black box driver, then HTTP is really your only means of communicating with the site. You could probably use the black box driver against Drupal.org. Uh, I don't have any like administrative access to Drupal.org, but I could probably use the black box driver and just interact over HTTP. The Drush driver moves the Drupal site a little bit closer to Behat. So we're getting a little bit closer. We can access our site over SSH. We can execute some Drush commands. This is gonna let us do some fancy things like write steps saying, given I'm logged in as an administrator. The way that actually works is we have a Drush command that creates a new user and sets a, a certain password. And then with that set, you can you know, sign in as that user. Finally, the Drupal API driver moves the Drupal site very, very close to Behat. They're literally just running on the same server. The same PHP functions can be called in either. So with that, you get a whole lot of power. You can call node save from your, your Behat steps. You can do anything directly on the Drupal site with the, the Drupal API driver. Extensions, the, the third term in our, our glossary here. When you hear about Behat extensions, you can really just think about modules to use the, the phrase from the Drupal community. We say there's a module for that. In Behat, basically, there's an extension for that. So if you want to do something like add some, some Behat tests specific to SEO to check uh, meta tags or, or metadata on your HTML responses, well, there's an SEO extension for, for Behat. If you want to do things like analyzing your tests themselves, find out how fast or slow they are, uh, find out how many times you're calling individual steps, there are uh, extensions for that taking screenshots of failures, a bunch of different extensions for testing REST APIs, uh, and of course, integration to other systems like Symfony, WordPress, uh, and we've been talking a bit about the, the Drupal extension. If you have a, a deeper familiarity with Behat, then you can start to bend it a little more. Just as, as you become more familiar with, uh, with Drupal, you get um, access to, to deeper and, and deeper layers. You get more and more comfortable um, doing things with, with Drupal that aren't available out of the box, the same dynamic is present in, in Behat. So I wanna talk about one way we use uh, Behat a, a little more deeply. So uh, again, taking those, those WordPress tests that just validate normal WordPress core behavior. In order to validate normal WordPress core behavior, we have to sign in as an administrator. And when we wrote these tests, there wasn't a robust WordPress extension the way there is with Drupal. So I had to write my own step in order to log in as an administrator with WordPress. And it's, it's not all that fancy. Uh, all it does is use some environmental variables to, to set the WordPress administrative username and password. And then I can just go to the WordPress login page and log in because I know what the HTML form elements are. And that works for basically all of our, our plugins. There's one plugin though where this doesn't work. We have a plugin for SAML, single sign-on. The whole purpose of this plugin is to override the login form. So when I tried to, to, to hook up our pre-existing BHAT tests to this plugin, it didn't work because those tests were dependent on logging in to WordPress in a very specific way. Uh, to get around that problem, all I have to do is override that one context that supplies the uh, implementation details for administrative login uh, with, a, with a different class specific to SAML, this SAML plugin that we have, and then slightly different form fields, basically doing the same thing. Again, using um, uh, global variables here for the username and password, but accessing slightly different administrative forms, and then those same Behat, uh, dot feature files can execute. Those same feature files that uh, have expectations around adding 
posts, adding users, adding comments, can all execute against the, the SAML plugin the same way they execute against all the other ones because we've overridden just this one part. So when, when do you actually start using BHAT? Again, to quote Michelle Krejci, you should write your tests early and often. Ideally, at the beginning of a project, you have a, a great conversation with all your stakeholders. Everyone gets in the same room. Everyone smiles. Everyone has a common understanding of what we're doing, and, and it's all wonderful. Uh, I don't think you can actually expect it to go like that. How, how do you really start to use BHAT? Like, there, there is a lot of complexity here. I, I have shown you a lot of complexity in, in BHAT. Uh, I've, been, I've been using it off and on for two years and I still feel like I'm learning it. I don't think you can jump from, from zero to 60 with BHAT. Uh, to quote myself from DrupalCon Dublin, the Agile Your Agile presentation, there's a lot of overlap uh, between the uh, Agile methodologies community and the, the behavior-driven development community that you'll see in BHAT. I think it's kind of weird that these, these methodologies that really uh, encourage us to work incrementally, take baby steps in the right direction, uh, I, I find it odd when there's also an expectation that we're going to jump to perfect Scrum all in one new project, or we're going to jump, jump to uh, perfect BHAT usage all in one project. I, I don't think that's reasonable. So again, to go back to those two main benefits that I think you can get using BHAT, a clear definition of done, a clear understanding with your client of what are we even building, and automatic execution. I think uh, when you're starting to use BHAT, you have to prioritize one, and bend on the other. So, uh, so which do you prioritize? Dan North, the guy who coined the term behavior-driven development, says the definition of done might actually be more important than the automatic testing because what good is, is automated testing if you built the wrong thing? What good is it if I get green check, check boxes that tell me, yes, my old user's block is still functioning the same way it functioned yesterday. The client never asked for old users, they wanted new users. So how do you, how do you get a clear definition of done without automatic execution? Uh, Demo-driven development. I don't think this term will catch on because DDD has already been claimed by domain-driven development, but this is, this is a term that we threw around informally at, at, at my last job at, at Palantir.net. We would talk about how every sprint we, we end with a demo for our client and we show them these are the stories we built and we would just have like an informal human readable script saying first you should demo the blog archive feature and then you should demo the, the new stuff on the home page and then show them the new user role and then show them the new field. So we just had an informal human readable script that said here's how you demonstrate that the sprint is done. Uh, so you can do that, like I could, I could have a human really human-friendly script saying the way I'm going to demo that this uh, new user block is done is well I'm just going to sign as an admin user, I'm going to make a new testing account, I'm going to click on the home page and then I'm going to say to my client, look, the new account that I just made is in this block. Like, this isn't really complex, but I do think it's a good idea before you start a ticket, before you start a user story, just think about and actually write down in a place that you and your other coworkers can see how you're going to demonstrate that you're actually done with the thing. I think you can get a clear definition of done without automatic execution. If you do want to focus on automatic execution, you may run into that pain point of, of wait, is testing going to make me slower? BHAT is this new thing that I have to use. It, it may take me an extra hour to write a BHAT test for this thing. I don't have time to write a BHAT test for every single thing I'm, I'm doing on, on my project. Well, I think you can start with the attitude of we're going to have a BHAT test or some kind of automated test for every single bug fix. Because by definition, a bug fix is something that has already broken. If you're concerned about writing unnecessary tests for things that aren't going to break, a bug is something that already broke. So you might as well write a test to verify that it doesn't break again. Uh, I think this is really helpful for data migrations. Uh, at my last job, I was doing a ton of Drupal uh, 6 to Drupal 7 migration. Now even, my, even in my free time, I, I do 7 to 8 migrations. As part of my job at, at Pantheon, I wrote a blog post and some documentation just showing that yes, you can use migrate module on Pantheon, migrating from uh, 7 to 8. So this is a, a pretty messy feature file, but this is a feature file that runs after uh, a series of Drush commands do the correct steps in the correct order to migrate from seven to eight. Then all I do here is, is validate that by going to node slash one on my Drupal 8 site, 
Then I see the text, test node made on, on D7. That's the name of the node that I made on Drupal 7. I even just check directly the exact HTML I expect for the, the image that I added on Drupal 7, and I even go to the exact uh, URL for that image, and I, I validate that it's a, a 200 instead of a 404. So it's not, it's not a pretty test. I wouldn't want to show this to an, an end client, but uh, this does automatically execute. Every single night, this test runs. It makes a brand new Pantheon multi-dev environment, does the correct rush commands in the correct order, migrating from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. This BHAT test runs, and then I know, great, that blog post that I wrote a year ago is still relatively accurate. Great. Uh, I, I even caught a bug this way. On a personal project, I was migrating from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, and often when I'm migrating, I just have the two windows open. I have my Drupal 8 site, I have my Drupal 7 site, and all I want to do is, is validate that the taxonomy terms, the nodes, come from one to the other. So I can just script that with, with BHAT. I can just say, like, on my Drupal 8 site, if I go to the taxonomy listing play, page, I should see blog tags, I should see iTunes categories. This is a test that actually failed because a couple months ago there was a genuine bug in Drupal core that broke taxonomy term migration. I probably wouldn't have caught that without this test, but because this test failed, I was able to find the appropriate issue on drupal.org, help review a patch, and get uh, an actual bug fixed in, in Drupal core. So if you're looking to experiment with BHAT in, in a way that, that's not going to require you to, to be uh, working too closely with, with your client, if you just want to do a, a developer-focused uh, introduction to, to BHAT, I recommend using it with migrations. Uh, BHAT is not a performance testing tool, but I kind of used it as one. Last summer, when we were comparing PHP uh, 5 against PHP 7 on Pantheon, we just wanted to show clearly, especially for authenticated traffic, PHP 7 is going to be genuinely faster. So I took a real Drupal 8 site being built by a major agency on Pantheon, and I asked them, hey, can I just script up some, some basic administrative behavior with BHAT? Basically, I'm going to make a node, I'm going to go to a a workbench moderation listing page and just click around a bunch. And I'm gonna do that in PHP 5 and PHP 7. And the result was, was pretty clear. It, it showed me that the exact same pattern of traffic uh, in PHP 7 is faster than the exact same pattern of traffic in PHP 5. Now again, uh, BHAT really isn't a performance testing tool. If you're comfortable with other performance testing tools, uh, you can script up this kind of thing yet more cleanly. But if you're just looking to experiment with BHAT, uh, this, this might be helpful. We even use uh, BHAT for testing command line tools. Here's a, a, a dot feature file for evaluating the behavior of the terminus command that enables new relic on a site. So it's a pretty simple command. I just want to point out this, this portion. The command is terminus new relic colon enable, and then you, you give it the site name. And we just want to validate that when you run that command, you're going to get back from Terminus that New Relic has been enabled and that our environments have been reconfigured. So uh, again, if you're looking for a more developer-oriented way of experimenting with BHAT, you can use it on, on command line tools that you might be writing. Another detail I want to point out here is this at VCR annotation. This is, is telling us uh, which uh, predetermined HTTP interaction is going to be referenced. It would be pretty slow to run our, our full suite of Terminus BHAT tests uh, using real HTTP against the, the Pantheon API. So we have those uh, pre-baked with this VCR plugin that's just going to replay the same HTTP interaction. I'm also excited because there's a new extension for for WordPress, for, for a couple of years there have been a, a few WordPress extensions that got started and then didn't really go anywhere. We've got a new one in the community that's really modeled after the, the extension that's uh, present in the, the Drupal community. Uh, I think in the, the coming months or, or year or so, we'll be looking at refactoring our, our WordPress tests around a much more robust uh, BHAT, uh, BHAT tool uh, in WordPress. So uh, what have I learned with all my, uh, my BHAT work? Uh, bending BHAT's benefits, again, be willing to bend. I think if you're trying to get both of those main benefits of a clear definition of done and automatic execution, you're probably going to have to sacrifice on one in order to get the other at first. Uh, BHAT, behavior-driven development in general, really is about the communication that you have with your team, the communication that you have with your client. So uh, find teammates to work with. Uh, prioritize tests that will 
fail. It sounds odd, of course, we want our tests to pass, but if they never fail, I, I sometimes wonder, why did I write that test at all? And ideally, you want them to fail meaningfully. You want them to fail in a way that gives you meaningful information. Some of our WordPress tests just fail because uh, WordPress has, has changed uh, HTML implementation details, and it's not so much a, a meaningful fail, it's just that somewhere we've assumed a certain HTML structure, and then sometimes that breaks. Uh, I think when you're working with a new tool like Behat, you're going to have to practice. Uh, it, it can be time consuming to, to learn these new tools. You may not have time uh, on a, a billable client project to, to learn something brand new if you're, if you're new to Behat. Uh, I, also think, I also think it's fun to, to get creative. So I do uh, want to take this opportunity to introduce a new Behat extension. Uh, it's a Behat extension that I have released under my, uh, my joke GitHub account for uh, faux Al Gore. This is the Behat Say extension. This is a, a extension that uses the say command that's present on, on most Unix systems to say out loud your Behat tests as they run. So I'm gonna switch Git branches here. Uh, I'll do the Behat Oh, I need a T. It's another risky live demo, and this, uh, I fill an edit name with testing at example.com. Given I fill an edit name with test account one. Given I fill an edit pass pass one with some random pass. Given I fill an edit pass pass two with some random pass. Given I press create new account. When I visit, then I should see test account one in the block views block who s new block one element. So, so why would you actually use this? Uh, this, again, is a, a joke or novelty BHAT extension. I kind of missed the culture of novelty or joke modules that we had in, in Drupal and Drupal 6 and Drupal 7, the, the bad judgment module, the misery module. Uh, I want to introduce some, some joke BHAT extensions. And yes, this, this isn't meant for normal usage, but I think it does make two helpful points. Uh, it makes the point that you can write ridiculous uh, BHAT steps that really aren't friendly to your clients. If you hear these steps spoken aloud, if you hear spoken aloud, block views block who's new block one, that's a sign that this is a ridiculous test. This is not something that I would want to show to it to my end client. I would much rather show them uh, this scenario. Another thing I, I help this, I, I think this helps highlight is the concept of user roles. I found that one. Uh, one problematic pattern I get into with, with writing BHAT tests is it's really tempt tempting to just write everything around the administrative user because the administrative user can use that, uh, can do anything. Uh, you're not gonna run into a, a permissions error, but the whole point here is thinking about who is actually doing these things. So if I set different voices for these different uh, user accounts, if I set uh, Fiona, oh wait, that's the local, if I set Fiona to be the administrator and cellos to be the moderator or, or any of the voices that you can get from the say command. I can reinforce for myself that these are different, these are different people. They, these different people have different expectations. So uh, again, this is, this is uh, actually out on the internet. If you do want to add this to your project, you can do so. It is registered on, on Packagist, just composer require faux Al Gore slash be hat say extension, uh, and you'll be you'll be good to go.
Thanks, everyone. Uh, of course, later this week, we've got contributor sprints, uh, and I think we've got a few more uh, minutes here for, for questions. Yes, uh, please use the microphone at the, at the center. I, after um, BHAT fills out a form, um, it just, everything disappears, just swipes everything. Is there any way to save that form so you can go in and look and see all your fields filled out? Interesting. I think uh, I want to make sure I understand the question. Are you, are you saying is it possible to to see visually the form filled out before yeah. it's submitted? Would that be like a breakpoint before it hits save, and then you can go and look? Would that would, well, that it's important to remember that the the browser simulation is not necessarily using your is probably not using your own browser. It's it's using a simulated browser. But I, I'm not certain what the screenshotting tools would use. Like you can take screenshots of the end result. Okay. I'm not sure if you took a, a screenshot like midway if it would show the form fields being filled up, but it, it might. Anyone in the room know if if you took a, a screenshot before pressing save, what would happen? I haven't, All right, gotten, well, that. It's, it's I haven't gotten that far. <laughs> uh, you can use browser stack, it runs really slowly, but you can hook it up with browser stack and then run it and see what happens. Great. Yeah, so we got an answer from, mm -hmm. from the room here. Browser stack uh, will will let you do that. Okay. Uh, one more? One more? Yeah. Um, in, in that one slide you had where it, um, uh, you mentioned where it looks at the taxonomy vocabularies available and there's four listed, yeah. is there any way to say, and I should not see any other taxonomy terms in case somebody created one and you didn't want another, that's all you wanted? Yeah, you would probably need to write a custom okay. step there to, to say something like, and the, I mean, there, there might be a pre-written uh, step for something as abstract as like, and there are X rows in the table, like that, that might be a pre-written okay. step, but I, I, would, I would guess you would probably have to write your own step to, to count the exact number of rows in the table. Okay, thank you. Hi, first, thanks, I, I really enjoyed your presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm having the, essentially the Drupal 5 problem, uh, okay. which is to say Drupal 5 does not work until somebody tells you when you're a newbie you must download CCK and views. Sure. Uh, so it sounds like context drivers and extensions are crucial to having a kind experience with BHAT. Yes. Is there a resource for where to go to get the crucial specific ones that we're going to use for 80% of our Drupal things? Sure. I'll, I'll take and, this. And what they mean? I'll take this opportunity to, to plug a Pantheon repository. This is a repository that uh, that's an example of how you can use Composer, Drupal 8, Pantheon, all, all together with, with GitHub. And, uh, and, and because this is a continuous integration example, we want to show some tests. So we have uh, a bhat-pantheon.yaml file here that is using, in this case, just two contexts, the Drupal context and the mink context. So, so that will get you pretty far pretty fast uh, if you can use if you can start from this example. And uh, to just further the plug, if you, if you stop by the, the Pantheon booth demo, you'll see it uh, in action. Uh, it's a, a different example repository, but it shows the BHAT step actually, actually running. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Sure. So the question is, is it worth doing schedule monitoring, writing BHAT scripts? Script? So Interesting. So, so you're asking, would it be worthwhile to execute a BHAT test on so a schedule to, to yes. verify that your site is continuing to run? Right. Maybe. And the, the reason I hesitate is because uh, I, I'm hesitant about executing BHAT tests against a live site because some of your BHAT scenarios might do destructive things. They might right. delete real content or they might, it can they might add reports. content that you it don't want. It can affect on my analytics as well. So. Yeah. So, so if your if your BHAT tests if your BHAT tests don't do anything observable, uh, but you know, like the, the point of BHAT tests or part of the point is, is to do things that are observable, right. uh, then it might, may be safe to run them against um, a live site. So, so, so technically, yes, you absolutely can execute BHAT tests against a live site, but uh, it 
may not be a good idea to do so depending on the specific tests that you have. I mean, you can do it in different environments like at stage, uh, pre prod Absolutely. And yeah. so on, yeah. yeah. Just, I'm just curious. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm uh, writing BHAT tests for a site, a Drupal site, seven mm -hmm. site that has a lot of uh, content stored as entities, and mm -hmm. the Drupal extension seems to mainly help you with nodes. I think. Yes. So, where is a good place to go for templates for customizing, you know, creating that custom logic to support creating sure. entities? Sure. Uh, so, th there's the the concept of uh, of these contexts, the things that actually define your, your steps. So. Uh, yeah, it, it would be great if the, the Drupal extension just had generic uh, entity handling rather than like node specific or user specific handling. So the, uh, I guess the Drupal community correct answer is like open an issue on, on GitHub, engage with the maintainer and see if you can get that added uh, to the whole extension and then everyone can benefit from it. If you're just looking to add uh, custom functionality to, to your own project, the way I've, I've done so for this, um, this demonstration specifically is I've used the concept of sub-contexts. Uh, let me make this bigger here. Basically, it's, again, a, a simple PHP class uh, that's extending this Drupal sub-context base, and then I've, I've got some, well, here is where I did all the, the messy work of adding those, those breakpoints and a few other things that, that made the demo um, more demo friendly. Uh, but, but basically, you, you, you might uh, find it's easiest to use a subcontext like this to add additional Drupal functionality specific to your site. Sure. Hi. Um, how would you separate the tasks between like custom modules and your Drupal site? It may be, it may be difficult to draw a, a clear line between what behavior is expected only of the, the contrib modules and what behavior is expected of your site uh, only. And, and the, the reason I say that is, is to go back to those different types of testing, unit testing, uh, integration testing, and system testing. From the perspective of system testing, you don't know exactly where the boundary is between workbench moderation module and your add-on customization of workbench moderation module. Uh, with system testing, you only have the system in front of you. Uh, it may not be clear exactly where the boundaries are. So uh, if, if what we're talking about is an individual client site, and uh, it could be helpful conceptually to have uh, a directory of feature files that are, are just validating what, what you think is the core behavior or the contrib module behavior separate from behavior that you've really customized. Um, that to me, like, that's something you could do for your own organization, but on a technical level, BHAT is just seeing a Drupal site. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily know where the boundaries are between what the behavior was when the contrib module was enabled and what the behavior is because you've done some customization. Thank you, that makes sense. Sure. So you mentioned uh, BHAT running on a production-like environment. But yes. But also doing things where it's like adding users and content and things. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, you would want a like staging environment where you have your latest live content. Uh, maybe you run that if you have a large database, like mm -hmm. gigs and gigs. That yeah. could be a heavy operation. Absolutely. You don't want to run it every time testing. Is there an easy way, short of restoring a backup and doing a reset, to kind of get rid of uh, clean up BHAT's mess? So you don't sure. Have to do a full uh, so import. Mm -hmm. So there are a, a number of different strategies you can implement there. I, I've talked to some agencies that using Pantheon have an automated script that on a nightly basis copies the, the database from live down to a, a multi-dev that exists only to have a smaller database. Like they copy the full database from live to the multi-dev and then they run a script that just like drops a ton of nodes thereby uh, greatly reducing the size of the database. And then they, in their automated tests, can grab that database, not the, not the full live database, the trimmed down database from a multi dev So you could do that. Uh, another way you could think about it is um, the given step is where you should do any setup that you need. So if you're writing a scenario that depends on the fact that there are 10 nodes on the home page, then, then you probably have a, a step like given there are 10 nodes on the home page. And, and then you can fulfill that uh, expectation however you want um, in PHP. You might use like Drush develop generate to generate uh, 10 new nodes. You might 
um, just go through all the forms directly in HTML and, and make uh, the 10 new nodes that way. So I, I guess the, like, the, the correct answer from the, the BHAT perspective is the given step is where you do whatever setup you want in whatever way you want. I think in practice, to, to make it fast, if you want a production-like database that's still smaller than your gigs and gigs real production database, it's probably best to just have like a .sql file sitting somewhere that you can grab and quickly throw into your, your production-like site. Yeah, so I have a question about UI testing. Um, so if it makes sense to use BHAT with uh, UI testing over Selenium or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, how would you set up a specific test for different breakpoints? So let's just say you wanted to test on Chrome, but at two different screen sizes, mm -hmm. how would you organize that? Yeah, I think uh, uh, that may be a line item in this table for different mink contexts of the, the understanding of breakpoints. Uh, window resizing here. So, uh, so the, the very, very simple GOOT doesn't have the concept of window resizing, but Selenium does. Um, so I, I think that would be the, like, the means through which you, you conceptualize of, of different device breakpoints. All right, well, thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>